And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother, Chris, the king of the fellas, creator of the upcoming game, Plan the upcoming game Planet Bound, the one and only Jeremy M. Jack. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing fantastic. So one of my favorite things about talking to you, Mildred, and doing your podcast is that I can I can say things like the greatest shit show. I can I can cuss <laughs> on I can cuss on this podcast. A lot of a lot of authors and a lot of a little bit more uh, sensitive uh, uh, podcasts. I I have to be a little bit more polite. Yeah, I um I am not. Nobody would be pol nobody be polite with, when dr when drinking, so I have no I have no <laughs> compunction about that. Plus, some for me, it's just a case of at the end of the day, they're just words. Yeah. Like if if you react that if you react that way to words, that's your own fault. There you go. It's it's it's, it's kind of like a um. It's kind of like a Rorschach test. <laughs> Like you're gonna, yep, you're gonna you're see. You're the one it. applying the meaning. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're gonna see. You're gonna see what you see out of it, but it's not. But <laughs> that doesn't. But that doesn't mean that it's it. That what you're seeing is inherent. Yeah. Um. So we had kind. We had kind of went into a a bit a bit of things. Um, kind of taking a broad brush approach with um, Planet Bound. The last time I had you on. Yeah. Now. You've recently uh, launched it launched it on on oh, no, Kickstarter, and one thing that um I found I found a bit amusing was when I saw that um the that the um Inspirals team um mm -hmm. had um put, had sh had shared said Kickstarter. Um, yeah, I'm get I'm guessing part of that is that um because they didn't because. Maybe you had maybe you had mentioned this and it just and it just slipped and it just slipped through me at the time, but I was I was not aware at the time that you um had a um ASL background. Yeah, I can't even remember if we really talked about it or it may have been just super slight. I think it was one of those things that was mentioned very briefly, but we didn't yeah. really delve into it at the time. Mm. Mm hmm. Now, when it comes now. When it comes to when it comes to Planet Bound, as far as um, from the last time I had you on to now, aside from launching the Kickstarter, what's significantly uh, changed about the approach? So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, a lot of it was building up to the Kickstarter. Uh, mm -hmm. We did a we did a pre-sale campaign um, from Star Wars Day, May the Fourth, that ran all the way to. Gygax Day, uh, and then we started the Kickstarter on my birthday, which is also Star Trek Day, mm -hmm. and that'll run through um, Arneson Day, because uh, you know I got to I got to give homage to where homage is given, especially when it comes to my game, which is a huge influence from all things sci-fi fantasy, namely Star Wars and Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So since as this has been going on, uh, one of the things that has really probably been the most significant advancement change slash advancement in the game is when we really took a look at the mechanics. Um, as, as uh, the fellows were looking at the mechanics and, and digging through them, one of the uh, master fellows uh, is my cousin. His name is Travis story. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, with the, 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 the variation on the main, uh, one of the two protagonists or story, his is S T O R I. My cousin is S story S T O R Y. Mm -hmm. He's a great, brilliant writer himself. Uh, I'm sure he'll do some amazing stuff for um, successor games at some point when it comes to the writing. But he's also insanely brilliant with mechanics. He was always uh, the the role of uh, me mechanic watch, <laughs> rules watch in a lot of our games, and uh, he's just always been able to come up with some really good concepts around how mechanics can flow with whatever you're desiring to do with the game. So whatever your game's premise is, whatever the um, philosophy around how you are desiring to play the game, he, he, he's really good with coming up with 
ways to um, adapt to those things. So the, the mechanic drives whatever your storyline is and drives whatever your uh, premise and philosophy for, for your game. And so when we were looking at it, I had done the same thing myself um, with the, the guy who I had worked on the game for the last five years with. We, that's, that was our whole point of building the edge system was to build it in a way to essentially the system itself teaches people how the game was originally played. Mm -hmm. And it, and it worked to the degree that it worked until my cousin comes along and says, you know, Jer, uh, I don't know if you ever got to see this, but uh, me and the guy you were working on the game with, we had sat down and we had talked about this stuff. And this is what I presented to him. And I hadn't seen this stuff, Mildra. And so he's showing it to me and it was blowing my mind because you know, we talked about how much I love the idea, especially when it comes to combat, of it being fast paced and not taking you out of the role playing experience. So the immersive experience that you're in, how do I keep that going once combat comes into play and then all of a sudden it becomes so crunchy that I'm, n I'm no longer in the experience? And what he was presenting to me when it came to using what I had come up with, meaning an attribute based system, because that's what I wanted to be heavily at. In fact, I wanted to be only attribute based system. I was tired. I mentioned it to you before. I was tired of games that you had attributes. Why do I even have a number there? Because this means nothing within the context of the game, except for maybe in a very little portion of things. So why aren't my attributes? Because this is these are the numbers that define everything that makes up my character. Why isn't this playing more of a part in what I'm not only what I'm doing, but what I'm able to accomplish, what I'm able to do in combat, what I'm able to do in my abilities, what I'm able to do in techniques. Uh, what I'm able to do in skills and not just based on one, but based on maybe a combination of them. Well, he shows me this. He goes, well, we're going to, what I'm thinking is we associate them, uh, your attribute numbers that you've come up with. Uh, we modify them and then we have it associated with die strength. So, so whatever the number is, is it falls under a specific dice. And then we're using the entire spectrum of the polyhedral dice. And so it's not a D20. So that's the biggest change. So we've gone from a D20 system. This is definitely not a D20 system. Mm -hmm. In fact, the D20 is the rarity in the game. Uh, and when it comes out, it's actually very, very special when the D20 comes out. And it's used for very, very specific reasons. So it's, it's almost like a, oh, shit, the D20 is coming out. Uh, you know, it's that type of feeling uh, in the game. Uh, and in fact, the D12 is probably your most powerful uh, of the regular polyhedral dice that you're going to use on, on a regular basis. But your attributes have a number that's associated with one of those dice. So establish a dice strength for whatever I'm trying to accomplish, for whatever skill or whatever thing in combat, whichever attribute is the ruling thing for that, I'm rolling a, a, the, the die strength that I have based on that attribute against whatever the die strength of of the thing that I'm coming up against, which could be the same attribute in some cases, or it could be a different attribute in some cases. For example, focus versus presence. So my mm -hmm. my ability, my presence, my ability to charm or 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 convince or um, uh, manipulate somebody, I can if I'm rolling that, it's rolled against their focus, their ability, their their mental capacity to re resist uh, uh, things like that because their ability to have a keen mind. So th whatever the die strength is between those are what's being rolled against each other. So in combat, it's, it's the um, celerity attribute, which is your dexterity, your, your deftness, your, your uh, um, agility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the celerity, and I swear to God, we're going to have to make t-shirts because that gets mispronounced all the time. It's such a great word, especially by definition, so it's such a perfect word to describe that deftness, that that agility, that that your, your that that skill, celerity. But people say it wrong all the time: serility, uh, celebrity, celery. <laughs> we have to make T-shirts that have all those words crossed out, and then a circle that says celerity. Um, so, so when you're using uh, celerity in in, in combat, uh, and you're using it against their celerity. Uh, for whatever move I'm trying to do. It's just, it's just die versus die. And it, so it's just really, really quick. Uh, and, be, and we still, of course, you're still using your edge factor and uh, meaning maintaining the edge in combat, only in one-on-one -on -one combat. So if I'm able to maintain the edge, I can get some real good kicks off. And then it feels like I was talking to you last time. It feels like that fast pace, 
uh, 90s good old 2D fighter where you've got somebody in the corner and you're able to rail until mm-hmm. they break the edge, right? Yeah. Now, when it com- when it comes to when it comes to that, um, as I was going th- as I was going through a lot of as I was going through a lot of the mater- material, um, mm-hmm. what I came to what I came to realize is that this has and maybe th- maybe this is something that we touched on last time, but it seems to have le- it seems to have its framework less in common with um, with d- with the d20 system and more with um the Pal- the palladium megaversal system um i would i would i would give it that yes um in fact i know i know we mentioned this at, last time too there was a period of time where planet bound was played with palladium's rules so it was a huge influence on the game and there's a lot of homages to to palladium as a whole in the game um, well, I think I mentioned the human unified regency's mm-hmm. capital city is it, that that's the name of it. It's palladium as, as homage to the fact that, that we were, we, we were playing riffs, heroes, Nightbane, and anything else that, that palladium was pumping out at the time, mm-hmm. like crazy. And then we loved the system at the time to the degree that we did. There was a lot that we didn't like about it. So we modified a lot in our own games. And especially when it came to planet bound, when we were using it. But yes, I would say it definitely has more of that feel um, than anything else. But it was another thing about Palladium that, again, drove me crazy: is that there were there were attributes that were just worthless. Uh, and I and I'm not trying to criticize it in a nasty way, but it's just like, why do I even have these attribute numbers? That they rarely, if ever, come into play, uh, and and when they do, it doesn't have significance over skills. In fact skills when it came to palladium that was one of my biggest complaints and while we've decided to go with a percentile skill system which i think is it's that was a great part of palladium Mm -hmm. in in it to the degree that it was except for that it was solely based on your on your intelligence that's that's the only thing that benefited your skills Uh, other than that it was just a percentage that went up by x amount per level yeah and i'm i'm guessing i'm guessing that whole issue of having Cert, certain certain attri- certain attributes um and the like be be almost useless or be used to such a small level that it's not worth it's not worth investing in them was yeah. one of the main impetuses for the edge system which yep given given my background i will admit i enjoy that edge is a uh, acronym um yeah <laughs> Every dice gets exercise, which yeah. I'm guessing I'm guessing in the full book that's going to be its own little um, sidebar expl- explaining yes. that little acronym because yes. there's no way you there's no way you can just have that just be in the no. uh, Kickstarter page without it getting used. No, yeah, exactly. it's total tongue in cheek, but it makes it made us laugh because we were like, okay, you know, is is there as I said, is there is there a way we can explain that the entire gambit of the polyhedral dice are being used and that I, there's very few systems that use it to this degree, including the D2, meaning a, a coin is used even. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, there. So my cousin, Travis, the, the guy who we've been working on the system with, he's like, well, every dice gets exercise in this system and don't we call it the edge system and we've laughed so hard about it tongue in cheek that i had to put it in there and it's got to be in the book too mm-hmm. um but when but even with that would you say that the die type that's going to get the most used is the percentile die no uh because because the attribute dice uh are are the dice that that are associated with your attributes are the d2 through mm-hmm. the d12 so those are the dice that I'm going to be using the most, unless I'm doing a very specific skill. When it comes to a specific skill, then yes, I'm going to, uh, I'll go ahead and use a percentile dice. But it is still, again, based on my attribute number. It's, it's actually my attribute number for whatever, whatever the governing attribute is for that skill. It's that number doubled becomes my percentile rule. Mm-hmm. So there will, be, uh, there will be times. But if I'm doing just regular actions within the game, if, and those actions are governed by um, an attribute, then nope, I'm rolling, I'm rolling the dice that's associated with that against whatever the, the, the equal opposite is in the world. Yeah. Now, when it, now when it comes to, um, 
when it comes to the whole idea of, of archetype and um, PCC or player character class, mm-hmm. where um, where would you where would you say the line is between what def- between what defines a archetype and what defines a class? Because obviously, it's only a matter of time before somebody, maybe even myself, um, <laughs> expands upon the um, expands upon what's available for each in some in some fashion. Yeah. So I think imp- I think drawing where that line is is important. It is it is important and it is a it is a clear distinction. So uh, uh, traditionally in role playing games, the archetype is called in many other games the alignment of the character. Mm-hmm. So usually when it comes to that, you're you're talking about good, bad, or otherwise uh, in most games. Um, or if not, it's still a fairly limited affair. When we know the diversity of what's possible in a human being's personality, not to mention species from across the cosmos, right, mm-hmm. is extremely diverse. And so when I looked at, and I mentioned this last time, but really looked into how I wanted to do alignments because we played so heavily and created so much around alignments and so much of the rewarding within Planet Bound was based on playing in character associated with your alignment. And we had expanded on these alignments to a great degree. When I was looking at at this and really wanting that to be such a driving factor in this game, like I had never seen it in any other game. And it just went down a rabbit hole. It was a beautiful rabbit hole. I don't mean it was a rabbit hole that got me overwhelmed. It Mm -hmm. just was an amazing thing when I looked at Jungian archetypes and I looked at um, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey stuff when he talks about archetypes, and I blended these things to come up with a, a twelve a twelve orientation system, but that there were four specific outlooks to those orientations. So therefore, you could combine these outlooks, which are I'll just, I'll name the outlooks because those are the most simple ways to go about this. Mm-hmm. The outlooks are the the self outlook, so the character that is focused on oneself and really nothing other than oneself. Even if they're doing things for other people, in the end they're looking to benefit themselves. The order outlook, those who are looking to create systems that benefit whatever their end game is. So systems and order um, establishment in order to it advance life uh with whatever and again remember these are not good bad or wrong there's no good evil versus good in any of these so it's whatever they're trying to accomplish it's just they do so in this orderly structured manner the Mm -hmm. social meaning the people the the players that do so whatever they're trying to accomplish with other people it's not a, a lone guy like the 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 first guy can be a lone wolf but even if he's not he's gonna be doing it for himself these guys are definitely the social uh, outlook is definitely doing it for other people and for their sakes as well. In fact, that's probably a big driving factor, even if it's just one other thing. In fact, there's a uh, an orientation that that is specific to it being just one other thing, including even maybe an object that becomes the 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 object of their devotion, whatever that devotion is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the fourth one being um, the soul uh, outlook, which is uh, ideology somebody whose basis of whatever they're trying to accomplish is based on something more than just the human aspect of things and interaction but some sort of bigger ideology in life so those four uh, outlooks can be applied to the 12 orientations there's some that naturally fit in those and so that's how it's said in the book here's the three that fit in this one here's the three that fit in this one so there's 12 altogether, right of the orientation however advanced players can really mix and match so I can do something that would normally fall under the, the philosophical aspects of a soul orientation with a self outlook. So I can put an orientation that normally falls under soul with the self and so can create some maniacal megalomaniac of a character. Um, oh, Um, Jeremy, you there? I think I lost you. Oh. Hang on, we'll get him back shortly.
but in Palladium system, they called your OCC. So this is your occupation. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that you do. And so leveling in that advances specifically skills, abilities, and techniques. So you're advancing your, your skill set, technique set, ability set, the differentiation being abilities, things that you, you, the character can naturally do based on their species or that specific class. Skills, meaning skills, things you can learn during that class. And techniques, things that you can do in combat. Uh, that all gets advanced there. So it, that, does, that may affect the attributes during the time that you're using the skill, but it doesn't permanently affect the attribute like it does when you're leveling up based on your uh, archetype. Mm-hmm. Now, when it com now when it comes to um, when it comes to what ar what ar what um, archetypes and um, PCCs develop, um, like admit when, with archetype it mentions core traits. Does that is that essentially attributes, or is there more, or is there more? To it's attributes. So 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 we. we it's, it's so funny how when you come to the res <laughs> I'm sure this happens to a lot of developers. It's like, okay, the, the thing has been called the thing for as long as it's been called the mm -hmm. thing in gaming. So in this mm -hmm. case, we're talking about attributes. So I'm like, okay, well, what, what do we want to call it in order to differentiate it and, and make it sound nifty? And you, so you can round and round about this. In fact, at one point, we thought of calling them edges because, okay, that's how you play to the edge in the game is you're playing based on your attributes that are your strengths, right? But really, in the end, they're just your attributes. So yeah. core trait edge got dropped, and they're just called attributes in the game. We all know what attributes are. It's not like anybody owns the rights to calling something attributes. Why not use this? What, 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 what are we trying to prove by forcing it to be a different name? So, yes, we're talking about attributes. Yeah. Now, when it comes... Now of course, when it comes to those, when it comes to those um, sets of attributes, you've get you've you've got to set you've got it in three pillars: mental, mm -hmm. physical, and of course, um, Nova. Yeah. Um, now each of now when it came when it came to the when it came to skip when it came to um, attributes relationship with skills. Mm -hmm. um, is you had meant you had mentioned the you had mentioned an issue with skills in um, Palladium. So what I'm curious is if there's going to be as massive of a skill list in um, Planet Bound as there is in Palladium. The answer to that is no, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I don't, and that doesn't say anything. Palladium had a great. I'm not saying anything bad about mm -hmm. their skills. They did a a decent job of organizing it the way that they did. Skills in this case is specific to other than the general skills that any player can use based on these attributes there's lists of things that any and all player players could do because that was another thing i think i mentioned before i wasn't going to have to have them use things like literacy uh or reading speaking when when these were normal things that were going to be general parts of of gameplay and it wasn't a world where they these things were for example, in Rifts, where that was a real thing, whether somebody was able to read or not read. So therefore, it, 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 having it as a skill was appropriate there. It's not, it's not appropriate here. And so list, the normal things that people would be able to do on a daily basis, those things are already listed under the attributes. When it comes to a skill, though, other than that, that's going to be class-based. But that does not mean that, that the skills won't overlap between the classes. Mm -hmm. the, the, they'll just come at different levels. And that's a really interesting thing, too. So maybe if I'm a peregrine, which is an explorer, a treasure hunter, and my wilderness survival skills are something I have at level one. Right, right off the bat, because that's who I am. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the guy traversing the landscape. I'm the nomad that is off on my own in tents and, 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 and exploring and, and trying to find the next great mystery of, of sanctum. Uh, oh, we'll talk about mm -hmm. name changes too. That had, to, that, that had, that's another big thing that is, that has happened. Uh, but then, but there may be other classes where that comes into play. Like maybe the clerics of Oa eventually um, have, or, or the Jad Gorak, the, the beast riders will also have, that type of uh, survival, but maybe it comes at level three for them. 
because it's not a right off the bat thing. It's something that they learn over time. So it's not like skills won't overlap between the classes, but they with that skills will be associated with classes, not general things that people pick. Mm -hmm. um, now, when it comes to when it, when it comes to um, the options that are that are given when it, during leveling up. Now, obviously, this is something that's in flux, but yeah, would it be f would it be fair to say that there's a I'm not going to say an extreme amount of flexibility, but a, but a good amount of wiggle room when it comes to what a uh, what a given archetype class um, combination can can develop, so you don't have um, those combinations being a little too samey. Yes, there is. There's definitely enough wiggle room, especially when it comes to the numbers and where you can apply things, because you're going to get each level gives me. So, for example, in my archetype, I have a certain number of attribute points that I can apply where I want to apply them. So nobody's going to apply them the same. They're mm -hmm. going to be applying them to the attributes that they're really looking to go after that are going to benefit their skills based on whatever class that they chose or benefit how they want to play in character. Same thing with the classes. They will also get points of um, percentile points that they can apply to their skills and they can only apply up to so many per level. Uh, meaning o never more than 5% on something. So even if they get 10% for the level that they got, they can't apply 10% to one skill. They can mm -hmm. apply up to 5% to the skill. But they can apply it to the skills that they want to so that they can continue to develop the skills that they think are important for their character. So yeah, there's definitely flexibility where there, it's just not going to be cookie cutter from one to the other. In fact, I don't think it would even be possible to be cookie cutter from one to the other. No, I think... It's, I think the I think the fact that you, there is multiple um, choices being made is what pre is what prevents that issue. Yeah. Um. But the the other thing the when it comes to skills, mm. one thing one thing that I'm one thing that I am uh, cu that I'm curious about is would it be would it be fair to to say that when it comes to um skip when it comes to the usage of skills that's where um percentage is going to be the most frequent yes specific to skills so not mm -hmm. not necessarily in abilities and not in techniques but yes specific to skills yeah um and when it and um when it comes when it comes to when it comes to that um had had there been had there been thought about doing about doing some sort of skill and specialty re relationship or was that something that was nixed early on G give me an example of a skill to specialty relationship um i suppose i suppose a do, do you mean skills that would be specific to that class and other other classes just won't have that ability to gain when, that skill? Whenever I, whenever I refer to specialties within a skill system, it's where a it's where the skill is is generally a, is generally a broad subject and the um, specialty is a more specific part of that that you're that yes. you're uh, better at. Yes. Um so, Yeah, that definitely comes into play. And, it, mm -hmm. and again, it's class-based. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, I'm, I'll, I use the, the, the survival uh, out in the wild example again, my ability, my survival skills. So maybe for a peregrine, these things are uh, going to be important, meaning my ability for first aid, just in case something happens to me, uh, or my ability to um, find food is going to be important. But for the Jod Gorak, who are beast riders, well, maybe their ability for animal husbandry is going to be way more important in their, their wilderness, the ability to find food for their animals and or the animal being part of the process of discovering things for them. Uh, mm -hmm. So having an animal at play puts a whole different take on their ability to survive in the wilderness versus the peregrines. So yes, specialties and that's just a, a small example but there's got to be specialties based on the class even if it's a broad skill category yeah now when it comes now when it comes to um these when it comes to the species mm. one thing one thing i'm curious about is where is um is what spe is um is 
I know that's going to confer the attribute maximums. Yes. But um, what? But what else is go, what else is going to be conferred to that? Is one of the? I'm guessing. Based, I'm guessing one of the one of the other things is probably is probably going to be things like um, like like um, size and brawn classes. But what, correct. But what else would there be in that particular um sandbox? Well, yeah, that so definitely when it comes to brawn classes and size classes, those those things make differences in the game. Um, where, especially when it comes to so the size classes affects movement, especially in combat. So if you're dealing with uh, the uh, close range combat, mid range combat, long range combat. So anywhere in the the three foot range, anywhere in the six foot range, anywhere in the nine foot range. There's stuff that goes outside of that range, but just to speak in generalities, if I'm if I'm a class one size, it's going to take me two moves to move in between those because I'm a little guy. I'm mm -hmm. I, I, we're talking the less than four feet tall characters. Uh, but if I'm in the mid, the, the class two, it's just going to take one. However, if I'm in the class four, I, 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 I can move through two in one step. Uh, so it, do, it absolutely affects things. It affects things, period, because you're not rolling different dice. It's still, for every attribute, it's 3d6. But 3d6 for a human versus 3d6 for a Allrec is a completely different thing they're in completely different classes so that their strength applies differently so you use a different table you use the brawn tables that you're talking about when it comes to their strength yep now so they may have the same mm -hmm. number you may have like a 15 human who has got a number 15 and the all rec has a 15 but it doesn't mean their their strength is the same all right um and i'm get i'm guessing i'm guessing that there there are a few <laughs> Race, there are a few racial abilities that each ra that each race is going to have. Yep. And um, now a lot, a lot of times when humans are used in fantasy or, e or even sci fantasy settings, um, the way the race is presented is this kind is this jack of all trades approach. Is yeah. that? Are is that an approach that you're going with? Or by the way, you said that it's it sounds like. That's not exactly the case. <laughs> no, and and I've always hated that they became this like kind of catch-all. Well, you know, just want to play a generalized character. Well, what are the things that make the human species unique in in many universes, but specifically in Planet Bound? What you know, what's the thing that 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 is the um, the special quote unquote factor for them? Well, the special quote unquote factor for them is number one their diversity and number two, their individuality, despite that diversity uh, and what they refer to as the human spirit. So this, mm -hmm. we, this goes into the history of humankind. So they, when, when you read about um, humans in their section of the book and the story and lore portion of things, you learn that they came from a pretty dark place, but then they went through an age of an enlightenment where they really let go of a lot of their misgivings around specifically religious wars so belief systems they let go and they and they went towards broader spiritual concepts and elevation of consciousness and science as a, a driving factor of things so as they went through this age of progress that that resulted in the age of expansion because then they left genesis their home planet uh and expanded out into the out into the cosmos they defined the philosophy of what they had come up with as the human spirit. That, that, that this is what defines us as human beings, that we are diverse yet individual, and we have the ability to overcome at all odds anything set against us. So even though the humans have, um, what was a word I want to use, degraded uh, in a lot of ways, meaning that they're, they're, the philosophy of the human spirit has been watered down significantly. There's still the underlying theme for it. So human, human, just being a human, their ability to use um, the attribute of presence uh, is, is a little bit bumped. And um, they're the way they show up in the world is, um, Hey, uh, no matter what we come up against, we, we can overcome it um, just by the fact that we're human beings and, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. 
And when it com- when it comes to um, when it comes to some of the when it comes to some of the other races, um, like when it comes to Bacad, it's it's mentioned on the Kickstarter that they tend to have a short lifespan. Yeah. Um, how short are we talking? Like thirty years? <laughs> uh, most of the time, yes. So technically, their lifespan lasts a, probably close to fifty years. But that they rarely last that long. <laughs> they're the they're they have this they have a, so like the humans have the humans philosophy of the human spirit. Their their philosophy in life is live full, die fast. So they are they just live life full out. They're fun characters to play because they they're fearless. They're the little guys with heart. So you know they're the waros and the uh, uh, kinder and the and the hobbits and the, you know, the little guys that do accomplish great things in the world. Uh, and they're crass and, uh, in your face and, uh, they don't hold back (laughs) a lot. So I think probably Kinder is the most uh, applicable comparisons when it comes to something that's already known in, in, in fantasy genres or playable fantasy genres they're they're uh, over the top to say the least um mm-hmm. they have an incredible metabolism so they use drugs without um boundaries and it has little effect on their on their physicality but they live so far out there that they often burn through their lives um, um pretty quick and they often go out in these fantastical fantastical ways um the peregrine meaning the traversers of the explorers of the world come from them. Their history is what started the, the peregrines. They were the big explorers of the cosmos when before everybody was trapped on sun death. And so in that exploration, they, uh, one of them who, who uh, his name was Arkander, Arkander, um, his, something to know about the back ed is that they are also beset with a really strong sense of wanderlust, even though they're very communal and, and they're very connected to each other, even family-wise, at some point in within that first 30 years of their life, they get hit hard with a, a, a wanderlust, and they, and they need to ex- go out on their own and explore their own sense of whatever, including some pretty grand adventures in some cases. But in the case of Arkander, that's what he made it. He made it into these huge adventures. He's like, I'm going to take my wanderlust and I'm going to touch every part of the cosmos. Well, his story became legendary. People wrote wrote tales about it uh, called The Quest of Arkander. And The Quest of Arkander is still in um, circulation even on on Sanctum. Mm-hmm. And and it's been, you know, that legendary. He started the peregrine, pe- meaning people who traverse the landscape and even amongst other species. But here, here on Sanctum, there's been a resurgence because they've discovered so many relics of this planet that have existed from way before all the species that are existing there now had got there. There's a history to this planet that's relatively unknown. So they're a big part of the exploration of that. Uh, so there's been this huge resurgence of of the peregrine and this idea of, hey, we're just going to go out and have have a great time going on adventures. The problem is they're not really good with particulars. They're just so about, about the adventure in the, in the Zodiac, they would be Sagittarians, right? They mm-hmm. just, they, you don't pay attention to, um, you know, uh, orderliness of it. They're just out there to have a good time. And so their maps are famous, but they're obvious. They're, they're infamously incomplete. <laughs> they, they don't, the particulars are just something that they don't, uh, they're like, okay, yes, we're going to go to the to the uh, the fantastical place over the hills that we've heard about, and it's that way. And they just start going. You know, mm-hmm. that's just the personality and how they show up in the world. Yeah, they're great fun. Um, now, when it com- now when it comes to the Jawarik, um, mm-hmm. like I, there's there's a few archetype comparisons that could that could that um that could be made i could i could make a hippie joke if i if i wanted to or i could make an elf joke if i wanted to <laughs> yes um, you can and you're going to die when you know where they originally i'm going to tell you where they originally came from and you're going to go oh my gosh uh, all right try me <laughs> so uh, on the ori- in the original iteration of planetbound the gorak were klingons <laughs> well given the fact that they're a warrior species that's not too yes. far off I'm I'm hoping th- I'm hoping that we're that in this case we're dealing with the properly written Klingons, not the um, 
not not the um, space Vikings that as they could be under bad writers. Oh, your sound may have cut out, Mildred. No, no, Sam. I'm hoping we're dealing with the bet. I'm hoping we're dealing with the uh, better written variant, not the space Vikings that could happen with um, bad writers writing about Klingons. You're you're gonna have to repeat that because your your sound cut out there for a second. All right. Um. Let's just when I have when it comes to when it comes to something like Klingons, I have a um. I have a complicated look at the, look at them because yes, um, the bad Klingon writing makes them into um sp- makes them into space Vikings. Yes, um, talking way too much about talking way too much about honor without um, without ri- without really understanding what what it's suppo- what they're supposed to be uh, yeah, discussing. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, um. Whereas the whereas the pro, whereas if you have them as um, space Mongolians or space samurai, then you're at least a little bit more on point. There and you go. Incidentally, this is one of the many many reasons why my preferences will always lean towards Deep Space Nine as far as as far as my Trek history. Yes, yes, me too. Um, me and you are in the same boat. Least least of which for the reason that I get to see Worf in a way that doesn't involve him constantly getting his ass kicked. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> even even if he even if he's inti- even if he, I would I would do the whole even if he's intimidated by Cisco. But let's be honest, everybody's intimidated by Cisco. Well, yeah, he's a great captain. He's an intimidating guy. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when it, now when it comes to them, yeah. um, given the fact that you mentioned them being being a warrior species, yeah. even though they're it's described that they're currently united as the Jawarak Nation. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing that more often than not, they've engaged in tribal conflicts with each other. Massive, yes. Like, so from their from their pre planet bound history all the way to planet bound itself, uh, they've been divided in what what they used to call kins. So family groups or societal groups that they called kins. Mm -hmm. Um, Their planet was so um, treacherous, meaning it was so dangerous that the Gorak actually hid away um, from encountering. Oh, that's good. I don't know if you can hear that outside, but people are, people are choosing to be obnoxious right now. So there was times uh, in their history that they, that they actually hid themselves away um, in underground societies until um, the, till the um, spiritual leader, and who's still referred to as the spiritual leader of their people, her name was Oa, until she decided to, to leave the dwellings of the underground and traverse the landscape. And instead of viewing it as treacherous, used her abilities with Nova, which they call core in, in their language, to commune with it instead and see that there could be an interrelationship even with the most treacherous aspects of it, especially the wildlife, but even the flora and fauna. So as she communed with this part of um, the world, others followed her um, and it became a movement. Uh, It essentially became a a quote unquote religion without it being cultish. So when they left uh, uh, Krakow, which was their home planet, when they left Krakow and and they came to Sanctum, um, on the way there, after they had split, so there was those who followed Oa and and became the new kins uh, who were living on the planet itself, Kraka. And then there was those who stayed in the underground, who referred to themselves as the old kins that stayed to the tradition of, of fear. Well, when they when when sun death was happening and everybody had to escape, everybody had to get to the planet. All of a sudden, the old kins show back up and they go, "Hey, you can't leave us behind." And so the new kins agreed to take them with them, but. The, their leader, Goros the Zealot, he mm-hmm. incited civil war. And so even on the way there, it started the, the um, disagreements, skirmishes that led all the way up to full-blown warfare when they got to Sanctum. And the, the two, the division of the old kids and the new kids went at each other for the first 30 years of being on the planet. Um until they were able to come together as the Gorak Nation, which meant them returning to the philosophies of Oa and re- regaining their core, uh, their connection to Nova. Mm-hmm. The core in their language is literally translated love. And so they're this extremely passionate people. 
and so even though they have a lot of brute strength, they are warriors for sure. They're extremely passionate. They're passionate in their relationships, uh, romantic relationships, all the way to friendships. And, and they're passionate in their feelings towards um, nature and, and animal life. So once they returned to that, there was this resurgence of core through the valley that they were in, and they, they dropped the idea of even having leadership and decided to act as one, the Gorak Nation. That's what allowed them to stay the hand of the human unified regency who was coming after them at that point, because it was still the 40 years war. Remember, this is apocalypse upon apocalypse upon apocalypse. Mm -hmm. So sun death all the way to the planetary disasters, the wars that happened before then and the wars that happened on the planet. So at the end of those wars, the humans came against the Gorak because the humans believe that the Nova born are the ones that caused all of this to happen, those who can use Nova. So they didn't see the clerics of Oa who could use Nova uh, as any different than, say, the Lodestar. So they, they came after them next after they had already defeated the Lodestar. And when they did, they had already come together as a nation with the Jad Gorak, the Beast Riders, and that's what allowed them to stay the hand of the the Regency and what eventually came to everybody coming to peace accords because they were just wiping each other out at that point. And one thing one thing that um definitely struck me about the des about the design when it came when it came to the Jawarak mm. um is the fact that um, is the fact that they seem to have um Almost, go almost gold or almost crystalline plate, which I get the feeling is not what that actually is. Um, no. <laughs> Remember, you're seeing unfinished illustrations, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have all of the shadow and light on it yet. Yeah. But I'm get. But I'm guessing. I'm guessing when it comes, would it be fair to say that when it comes to the G the Jaworic, they um they tend to they tend to favor. Clo close range weapons or we or weapons that other societies would consider primitive. Yes, uh, absolutely. So they, it's not like they don't have energy based coil weapons or what they're called. Cause coils are the energy source that that powers everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but also it powers weapons. So it's not like they don't have coil weapons, but they coil weapons are often in hand to hand combat type weapons. Uh, even even the lances that they use, like jousting spears, on the backs of their their monstrous beasts, they're still run by coils, so that they can do a significant amount of damage. And though, yes, they do favor. In fact, uh, like like the, the clerics of Oa, like clerics of many other um, genres, they don't use bladed weapons at all. They use um, blunted weapons. Yep. I remember when some. I remember when somebody asked asked me why. Why clerics had to use couldn't use bladed weapons and and um and um the thing that would always come to mind is a cer is a certain line from Firefly about 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 not about not about pre about preachers not killing. It's like yeah. yes, the Bible's quite specific. It yes. is, however, somewhat fuzzy on the subject of kneecaps. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. Yes. Um, oh, 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 was so into uh, the, they call her Oh, the mother, mm -hmm. you know, in history. Oh, it was so in tune with nature. You can't imagine this woman doing anything like that, but she certainly was capable of it. And yeah, that's the killing wasn't a thing. Nature should be communing with each other. However, war definitely was a thing uh, amongst the Gorak people. So having weapons was essential. So blunt weapons was the thing. Well, plus, didn't, didn't you mention that there were no shortage of threats on their home world? That's uh, correct. And I'm I'm pretty sure it's to the point that dying uh that um that dying of natural causes would probably be a case of you got eaten up by some wildlife. Yes. <laughs> That's basically what it looked like on Krakow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now when it comes to the now you've mentioned in the Kickstarter pitch that there's ten classes available. Yeah. And I want. I do want to go into do want to go do go into some of them to kind of get the general feel for what they're what they bring to the what they bring to the table and possibly yeah. make a few gags in the process. The first one <laughs> is when it comes to the robot pilots, which um, I smell. I smell glitter boy <laughs> with this. <laughs> yeah, it, it was so funny. Uh, I, I you're, the the reason you're making me laugh is because one of the master fellas will not stop calling them glitter boys. <laughs> I, 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 every time he says it, I'm like, Paul, 
I'm going to slap your face off of your face if you call the nobleman or the Rancor units a glitter boy one more time. <laughs> so, uh, of course, the idea of robot power vehicles has been a longstanding thing in, in many in many things pre rifts, mm-hmm. but the glitter boy did make it a, make it just a, a huge cool thing. There was so many uh, things about the glitter boy that I just didn't favor, uh, namely how the big boom gun worked, how you had to do all this stuff in order to actually even fire the damn thing. Uh, and that uh, what, what about uh, ar- armor like um, you know, pilot power armor that could be used in hand-to-hand combat just as a massive hand-to-hand combat. And so that's what I chose to do with the noblemen because the noblemen represent, you know, that concept of noble heroes of old. So the, 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 the armor itself has a massive shield that can be used as a weapon and the shield extends into a giant blade that has a massive reach because these things mm-hmm. are, you know, some uh, 12, 12 to 15 feet tall and they can, really really do some damage with those with those blades mm-hmm. in fact some glitter boys could be cut in half dang it with <laughs> blades <laughs> yeah now when it comes now um you mentioned you mentioned that these so the ump um, so when it comes to the when it comes to the robot itself you mentioned it being about 12 feet so mm-hmm. Would you say it leans more towards a mecha or more towards power armor? Uh, well, it is a mecha in that it is piloted. So the pilot does sit in the cockpit mm-hmm. of the chest. So you know how the glitter boy, you actually the arms and legs actually went into the arms and legs. That yeah. to me is more power armor where you're controlling it with your actual limbs. In mm-hmm. this case, that's not. They're actually sitting in a pilot seat inside the chest cavity. Yeah. Um, uh, next is Nova Born Hunters, which yeah. um, I th- I see th- I see that kind of name and I immediately think of think of things like the uh, Witch Hunters in Warhammer or the um, oh yeah or the se- or the um, the censors when it comes to when it comes to my own project yeah um, there are probably people who are who um, de- who try and track down those who go. I'd say I'm guessing they go. They tracked either, either pe- either rogue individuals who use Nova or just or are um zealots when it comes to Nova born. Period. Period. Yeah. Remember the human unified regency has their their rhetoric is the Nova born have caused this catastrophe called we are all stuck on this planet. They are the ones and and the whether they think that that's actually true or not, that's what they've used to control the masses. Mm -hmm. And so it's just become a propaganda machine for them. And so to do that, um, to come against them, they had to come up with a, a, a a manner in of doing so they really wanted to understand the Nova born. So for years they conducted some pretty horrific experiments on, on the Nova born, including, you know, dissecting while alive horrific horrific things that were done to uh nova born especially children well Mm -hmm. there was two there was a a, there was three sisters um who as they were being subjected to to torture the reaction through nova that they did was to void out um nova around them as a protective whether they knew they were doing it or not, it, it happened innately for them. So this protectant layer that they put around them is how the Sworn Sisters work. So the Sworn Sisters uh, are what they call voids. And the interesting thing about Nova is because it works in waves, when waves are next to each other and they're oscillating off of each other, eventually Nova born that are around each other have the potential to gain the skills of the other because of the waves being um, met in close contact with each other well more so when it comes to the voids so the voids if a nova born is exposed to one of the voids which by the way they're not able to sense or use nova in a void's presence meaning in one of the sworn sisters presence so it it negates it's like negate magic right it kills it if they're in proximity 
and if they're in proximity for a period of time, any in, uh, long periods of time, which that's what the Regency does, is that's what it subjects um, female humans, which is what how this works. So it seems to only work on female humans. There's reasons behind that that are that's part of the mystery of the whole thing. But the female humans that are exposed to it, female males that are, or excuse me, human males uh, that are f- female humans that are exposed to it they acquire the trait. So it's almost like a disease or a virus that they, and they become voids themselves. Human males that are exposed to it, they just die Mm -hmm. uh, from, from exposure to, to, to the void. Uh, It doesn't do anything to other species, but there's, there's more to the story, right? But what you need to know for playing the character is that the sworn sisters are essentially a a assassin group for the unified regency to go after Novaborn. Um, of course, Novaborn can't use their abilities in their presence, and they they kill them with those nasty bladed whips they have. Yep. So they capture them, but more often they they're they're assassins. They kill them. Yeah. Now, when it comes to biker mercenaries, <laughs> um, the th- is it a case? Is I'm pretty sure. Sh- I'm pretty sure. Some, I'm pretty sure somebody could could uh, make some Mad Max comparisons when it comes to that, <laughs> even if they're on, even if they're on a um, bike. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing the uh, the approach with that is is a kit is akin to is basically a sci-fi fantasy version of the um, the traveling knight on his horse. It's just that the horse is a bike in this case. Yes, you. They, yes, these guys are a little bit more outlandish than that, mm-hmm. though. Um, they're they're a little over the top. They, they 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 work the Crimson Cavalier. I mean, even their name is outlandish, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the the they work for one of the Ogre. So the Ogre are a non playable species on the planet. They're um, they're kingpins on the planet. There's not very many of them on this part of the planet. And they, they rule their own little empires, essentially. Um, and a lot of them are steeped in a lot of underground activity. Um, so some of them are crime bosses. Um, different levels of um, whatever criminal activity that they're involved in. Some mm-hmm. of them to a good degree. In this case, it's a good degree. Jono is the, is, the, um, is the Ogre in this case that the Crimson Cavalier work for. So these are his biker mercenaries. He has an outfit in New Genesis. So he's in human Regency territory, yet he does all of this underground work for the back at ministry because the back at ministry, even though they have a good standing relationship and trade agreement with the human Regency, they are actually in support of helping out the Nova born uh, and specifically direct support for the Lodestar who are in hiding. Mm hmm. Um, so he provides them. So the Crimson mm-hmm. Cavalier are kind of this outlandish uh, uh, right hand of Jonos that, uh, but they are still men for hire. So it's not like they don't, they can't work for other people other than Jono. So yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to tre- when it comes to treasure hunters, I'm guessing that's a case of exactly what it says on the tin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, cosmic went with cosmic wizards and sent and um, sentinels. I'm guessing this is gonna this is gonna be one of the um, one of the primary yeah. represent representatives of yeah the lodestar. Yeah, yeah, of the lodestar. So with the lodestar, there's really the, the, this is this is where it gets tricky because even though there's ten classes, really there's there, when it, the lodestar class has six classes within them mm-hmm. because you have the six rings right yeah. of the lodestar. And so each of the rings are specialty. I loved doing this. This is something I really loved doing. I was really tired of magic systems or other, other meaning, meaning supernatural type abilities within games that were just overarching and you really didn't have specialties. You could just pick from a giant list of things to, to a degree. Now, it's not, it's not saying that there aren't specialties out there. So when I did this, I really wanted to make it... Okay, the rings once the once their leader way before sun death three hundred years ago died, the the other leaders the six leaders that were left when their when their um, ultimate leader passed away they really were at a loss of how they were going to handle 
their organization, their faction called the Lodestar. So they decided, well, each of us will take our students and create a ring of discipline around that based on the things that are the most important to us. Well, there was people who disagreed with that and they left and that's a whole nother side story. But the Lodestar as a whole then divided themselves up into six rings. And so the six rings have very various specialties. So each of them is their own class. When you play one of the Lodestar class, you do have to pick one of the rings and you do advance in that ring with the abilities associated with that ring. Mm-hmm. Now, and it's not like, and again, it's not like they don't overlap, but they just overlap at different levels and for different reasons based on what that, what that rings goals, ambitions, philosophy are, is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, gu- I'm guessing, I'm guessing the difference between, um, Something like something like wizards and um sent and sentinels is how they choose to apl- how they choose to apply um nova. So the the crazy thing is that the sentinels are non nova users. So the that's what makes them a powerful force against the the sworn sisters. Mm-hmm. So that's that that's their combatants. So the the sentinels are actually guardians of the lodestar because they can come against sworn sisters where the lodestar can't once they're in proximity they can't even use their abilities so um the sentinels though can because the nova that they use is tied to them so they there's several ways that this happened the alternate ring who can create physical things out of nova created their their suits and their suits have nodes of what what's called Jagradal crystal, which enhances Nova. So Jagradal crystal is a natural element that comes from the tolerance species. The tolerance species is in book two, but on their home world, Jagradal crystals are where, where these crystals came from. And these crystals can be used when Nova waves are put through them to enhance Nova waves. So they have Mm -hmm. small nodes of these crystals embedded in the suit. So they were designed and, and created through Nova from the alternate sphere. Then the, um, resonance sphere harmonically tie the suit to the user so that the user, even though they're not Nova born is able to connect to the suit and use the suit at will. Then the Oslo sphere tied in its ability of the, the suit's ability, which mm-hmm. is essentially to create active ectoplasm with their mind around the suit. So they can change that ectoplasm to the range that it has into anything that they want. And it's a pretty strong element. They can use it to fight they can use it to overcome, and they can use it right in front of the Sworn Sisters, and it doesn't negate it because they're not Nova born. Yep. And when you when you mentioned that whole negation, one of the main thing, one of the big things that came to mind for me was the um, the Pariah gene in um, oh. 40k. Okay. Um, I don't know how familiar I am. Pariahs. The if the if the effect of it it the effect of it differs if they act, if they even survive because most of the time they don't since uh. the the weak version of it just results in blanks people who are just um invisible within within the warp and um demons can, demons can't see them they can't they um they can't really be targeted by psychic effects and so and so on. Nice. The extreme end of things is per, is pariahs who not only can, not only cancel it out, but a psyker even being near them causes that psyker physical pain. Yeah, and e- and even normal people tend to give them a wide berth because they can't explain what it is about them, but they fe- but they feel that there is something wrong about yeah. them. And um, sometimes sometimes it's just a case of creeping someone out. In extreme cases. They they might lash out. Yes. Um, because because there is a degree of nova in everything because mm-hmm. nova is all that is right. It's the energy of all that is. That they they have the same feeling around the sworn sisters, even normal people. It's it's uncomfortable. People don't interact with them as in like friendship or society. Yep. Now, when it comes to um, warrior shamans and um, beast riders. Yeah. Um, with warrior shamans, Begora. with warrior shamans, I'm get I'm guessing this would be um akin to clerics in other games. Yes, yeah, they're the clerics of Oa, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to beast riders, now uh, the ma- the um the main thing the main thing 
that I want that I that I'm curious about is is it a case like a lot of times with say a ranger in D and D, they'll usually have an animal mm. companion and they'll be and they'll be stuck with that. With um, beast riders, is it more of a case of they're just good they're just good at um, getting at getting along with animals in, in order to in order to ride them. Yes, so they don't have familiars mm-hmm. uh, in, in that sense, but they usually become fairly attached to their specific animal that they that they have chosen to ride, um, and they have they have a bond with that animal. Now, the Guarax bond is a natural bond; it's 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 their species, so it's an ability of their species to interact with nature in that way. It's enhanced through Nova um, if they're Nova born. But it's it. They, all of them have this ability, and the Jad Gorak um, have just honed that ability, uh, specifically when it comes to wildlife. And so, in gameplay, there's three specific beasts that they ride. Mm-hmm. One of them is a large, um, hulking beast that does a lot of physical damage and can go in and just plow things uh, down. One of them is a flying beast um, that can really nimbly move through and attack from above. Um, grab things, take them way up in the air, drop them. That's how they were able to come up against <laughs> the glitter boys, quote unquote, the, the noblemen, the rancor units. Because once the rancor units were coming, uh, the rancor units with their um, heavy uh, blades and stuff were able to cut down even those large beasts. But once the Vortan, the flying beasts, were able to come into the picture, they were they were able to just massacre the the noblemen because they could grab them, lift them into the air, and just drop them. It's something that heavy just being dropped from that far above mm-hmm. was just leaving them twisted hunks of metal. And then the um, Zarkan are small, fast. So it's, it's this uh, uh, cat like creature that is very, very quick and uh, has a um, scorpion like tail that can run in and out. Uh, so a lot of guerrilla tactics, they're just in and out and they could take on the sworn sisters because uh, the Jad Gorak don't necessarily need to be Nova born. They can get to the Sworn Sisters quickly, mm-hmm. take them down, and then get out of there before any of the other noblemen come up against them. Yeah. Now, when it now um when it comes to um, desert pirates and thug mechanics, I'm get <laughs> like when when I when I see the concept of desert pirates, one of the main things that that comes to mind especially given the background of Star Wars, is uh, swoop gangs. Oh, yeah, that's not a bad comparison. I'll tell you where what the origin is, but yeah, that's not a bad comparison. Mm-hmm. Uh, the origin is because uh, the guy who was working on Planet Bound with me at the time, uh, he and I were huge, huge fans, and still are. We're huge Disney freaks. And one of our business biggest Disney um, loves is Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. So having a representation of that idea of a group of uh, people that are lost without each other in the world and came from wherever they came from. And in this case, we, we established them as ex cons. So one of the things about the humans and the human spirits, they were one of the, they were one of the only species that brought their prisoners with them to sanctum. Well, during the sun death wars and during the, you know, everybody trying to escape to the planet before sun death happens. So many of those ships got lost. A lot of them crashed and burned, but one of them called the, um, the lost souls, the United Regency, uh, spaceship, the lost souls crashed and they survived. And so these, these ex cons then were in the, they, they, they crashed in the middle of the desert, the massive dune desert, mm-hmm. uh, below Gorak territory. And so it just became a matter of survival for them. And so they worked together, even though they were all ex-cons and criminals. One of them ended up taking leadership and established a code among them. And so they, they behave, though, similarly to the Lost Boys. They, they have the, the, their little um, desert enclave is called the Fort. And it's got all these, it's these massive spires, like, you know, rock spires that they've carved out into these... Um, really cool different areas, including things like the galley and, and the crow's nest, which is their radar system that also like um, tricks people with um, distress signals to come into their territory where they're able mm-hmm. to take them down and, and steal from them. Cause of course they're pirates uh, and, or have become pirates um, all the way to the, um, 
they're, 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 I'm trying to think of the names of the other spires. One of them's their hangar bay. Um, but they're all, they're all named after things like on, on a, on a pirate's ship. And the, uh, so they're called the hooligans. That's the name. That's, that's what they ended up calling themselves. So the hooligans are the desert pirates. That's the character class is you play a hooligan. The tinker is also a, a hooligan, but it's a specific when, it, when the thug mechanic is the tinker. So the tinkers were the, the guys who had uh, a savant brilliance towards working with machines and basically saved the hooligans lives because they converted the ship into something livable for them and, and repurposed all of it and then found other ships in the desert and repurposed it. So they built their entire society around repurposed ships and other things that have been crashed in the desert during mm-hmm. the mass exodus after sun death. Yeah. Um, given the whole pirate thing, I'm wondering if they similarly have a pirate code that they follow, even oh, if yes. it's really loose. Yes, they do. They call it the oath. Um, what they would be some it, of the, and what, they, they, so they, so they, 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 they do it in such grandiose fashion that when one of the hooligans takes on the oath, they're, 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 they have to read the oath, the, the statement that was originally a speech by the ransack King. So the guy, mm-hmm. the guy who ended up taking leadership, his name is Ark the claw. And, and, uh, <laughs> so he, and, and known by the people as the ransack King. And so the ransack King gave this grandiose speech that became the speech that everybody gives as they take the oath. And they're, as they're doing it, they're booed and heckled and things are thrown at them. And they, I mean, it's, they're, 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 they're children. They're the, they're, they're truly the epitome of the lost boys. Uh, and, and they act in the most obnoxious and immature, immature fashion. So some of the codes involve how they um, divide up their treasures when they're going on looting things and, the roles and parts that people played in that and therefore how much percentage of the treasure and how much percentage of the treasure then goes to the, to the hooligans as a whole. Uh, it has to do with their oath to their quartermasters. That's what the, the ship captains are called and, um, and who they serve under and, and their loyalty to them and what the loyalty means. So it's, it's their, it's a loyal, it's, it's a loyalty code to, to the hooligans and nothing outside They're They're, ideology around not being um forced into uh normal society without it being total anarchy because it's not total anarchy they still Mm -hmm. live by the oath and they still support each other but it is loyalty to a brotherhood rather than loyalty to a government and given given that loyalty i'm guessing that somebody who breaks it is um harsh is well, I was going to say harshly punished, but ousted it is harshly punished, which means ousted. I mean, you can't survive in the dune waste on your own. So, uh, but the fun fact they are, and I'll just we'll give a little preview. So, the Kickstarter edition of the game, the the exclusive Kickstarter edition of the game, mm-hmm. has an additional species and an additional class, and it has to do with this. So, it has to do with one of the uh, hooligans who was ousted, but took a following with him. And if you want to play, he, his, his name was Van Crude. <laughs> they have these obnoxious names, right? And it has, this is a throwback to a, a villain of one of the original fellas that he used in a heroes campaign, like a Palladian heroes campaign, that this villain would not die no matter what. And if we did die, his cousin would come back and haunt us. Or, <laughs> but I mean, it was just ridiculous. And his name was Van Crude. And so the, this, this Van Crude in this iteration of Planet Bound uh, has is an offshoot of the hooligans and they actually are the uh, gatekeepers to the dune waste that goes into the wildlands where there's a lot of uh, non-sentient species uh, down there it's a very dangerous place but they're they're the ones that um, hold the hold the grounds for whether you can enter that area or not and the species that you can play is primarily made up of a desert species a reptilian species Mm-hmm. that you can play that can survive in the desert. That's the way the reason that they did survive, but they're an, they're an eccentric group that, that, that use their, this whole, we are van. They, they, they see the, the reptilian species that they are is um, communal. So they have this concept of we, so they have this uh, Negan type thing of we are van crude. Right. And, and they speak in this manner, like anything is van anything. So they, I'm going to van destroy you. And then, and then it's, or this, this will be a fantastic journey. <laughs> they're, they're this obnoxious group of things, but they are the extra class. And, uh, 
and uh, species uh, in the in the Kickstarter edition, and it's just a super fun element. That's a big throwback in the game, but you'll only be able to get it in, in the Kickstarter edition. They won't be put in anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, now, speak, now speaking of that, so the so um now you've, obviously there's obviously there's going to be a few stretch goals that'll that'll hopefully be um re- that'll hopefully be reached by the. Yes. T- by the time it finishes, but but um the end the end date is October 9th. You've correct already. You've already gotten a, you've already gotten a bit of um ways into into fu- into funding past the initial goal. Yeah. Um, now so, now we, we had a wonderful launch mm-hmm. when we launched it on my birthday. We did a big launch event and mm-hmm. that propelled it into the stratosphere. It was it was great fun. We had so many people. Um, who were part of the game over the last 30 years and who were part of this development that all got together. It was about, I don't know, 20 people on, on Zoom, and we did this huge launch event. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the, now the, uh, question that, the question that I have is, once the, is once the, once the, um, once the um, Kickstarter is all wrapped up and all the extra pay work is finished are you mm-hmm. what what would you say would be the um release window that you're shooting for for end of um, october. book one end, end of october latest beginning of november but end of october is really what i would like it to be mm-hmm. that's what it's set in the timetable i mean it's so there's so very little left to do in it yeah it's it's what i usually cast a wide net whenever i ask this kind of thing because i know that things can happen oh they sure can so and I'm, and I'm definitely not and that's why and, and i don't and i don't have anything about that like mm-hmm. i don't have any like uh anxiety about that I, I i it's done meaning it's it's it is it's an absolute uh, there's no um i mean that this is happening and, and it's scheduled out all the way through book three because it's a mm-hmm. trilogy um yeah. and so it'll be it's scheduled out all the way to the final release of the third book is in april I thought about doing it in seasons of books because book seasons go around this time of year and then April and then back around this time of year. But RPGs are different. You know, people are looking for the next content once they once they've started to experience the book. And so regular and consistent material getting out there, uh, I think, is important, especially when you're talking about the core book. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes. Now, when it comes to when it comes to that, what. Um, I know this is only going to be the first book, but, um, what would, what would you, what would you say the uh, page size is probably going to be once it's all finished? Uh, with formatting, I, it's going to be, it's going to be at least, and it could be a lot more than this, but it could, it will be at least 200 pages. These two hundred, and hope hopefully, hopefully, un- unlike unlike certain Palladium books, will actually have an index. <laughs> yes, and so that's that's another big part of it. It will have an index, and it will have a glossary um, with pronunciation guides because you're talking about a lot of new stuff. The glossary will actually give you some hints because things are mentioned from the other portions of the world and, and other books already in book one, and they will have a reference in the glossary, so you get ideas about. Uh, some of this upcoming stuff mm-hmm. and I, I think a glossary was critical and a timeline it will include a timeline too because the, the, those so what's to know is that a lot of the re, um, changing of some of the nomenclature in the game happened in the editing process so it went through a dev editor a brilliant guy by the name of Matthew Goodwin he's a writer himself a cyberpunk writer into neon is his first book and it's the pseudo world uh, series and such good stuff when it comes to cyberpunk really good because it does a good job of a non antihero. So cyberpunk mm-hmm. usually has the antihero, right? He does mm-hmm. a great job of having an actual hero, similar to what they did with the matrix, having Neo a hero rather than an antihero, even though it was a cyberpunkish setting. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he's a great, fantastic editor because he's a gamer on top of it. So not only is he a dev editor, he's a gamer on top of it. So he was able to read planet bound with brand new eyes and give such amazing feedback because, you know, the, the fellows have been playing this for 30 years. So it's like we've used some of the nomenclature since we were kids. So calling the planet Homeworld was just what we've always called it. And the first the dev editor is like, yeah, that's that sounds like a kid. That sounds like a child thing. 
And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, dang. So, so really having to think about it. And, and um, my cousin Travis is the one who came up with, because it was hidden and it's hidden in the depths of the innermost parts of the cosmos. So innermost sanctum, so calling it sanctum as a, a religious or biblical reference was, was a great name for the, for the planet. But there was other names that changed too. The peregrine were called seekers. So we called them peregrine. Mm-hmm. Uh, other other names uh, were changed and whole and some whole concepts. The, it, he was so great at saying, hey, yeah, this is really working for you. And I, the reason I'm mentioning this is if you are an indie developer of games, do not dismiss the fact that your game book is a book. Uh, and the and it, it, so it's authorship. You are writing. You are an author at this point. Uh, yes, it's a game book. And yes, there's mechanics, but you are authoring a book have a developmental editor. I know it, there is cost associated with it, but it is well worth having somebody with fresh eyes look at your material and talk about how it's digestible or not digestible to the mass public and definitely get a copy editor. Because I thought my writing was pretty clean until I, I ran it through my copy editor and boy, my punctuation sucks, Milton. <laughs> are, we t- are we talking doctor <laughs> handwriting copy, bad? It's not- What's that? Are we talking doctor's handwriting bad? No, not doctor's handwriting bad, but holy smokes, my, my ability to use commas was way off <laughs> uh, on either side of using them and or not using them. I was just like, good grief. That was probably my biggest things was my use of commas. And mm-hmm. when I would use that instead of who, like blankety blank that blankety blank when it should have been blankety blank who mm-hmm. blankety blank. And, yeah. and I put that almost entirely throughout the document. I'm like... What? I thought my English was not that. And she was saying, no, it actually was pretty good. You know, comparatively, there's it's usually a lot worse. It's clear that you went through this with a fine tooth comb before you gave it to me. Um, but having a copy editor who knows nothing about gaming go through a gaming book was a really interesting uh, process. But I definitely would encourage indie creators. I know that there's a, a cost associated with it, but there is massive value in having a developmental editor and a copy editor look at your work. Yeah, there's, there's all, there is. If you want it to be a mm-hmm. professional game put out there, mm-hmm. then, then, then be professional. The, um, there's, there's always, there's always the risk of what, of what can happen if you, um, if someone makes their game a little bit too inside, I guess I'll say. Yeah. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, there was that, that was the dev, dev editor. He would have to say, Jer, I don't know. I, I'm lost here because I don't know. I don't know what you guys know. Mm-hmm. Uh, or I need more. That was, I would get that comment. I need more. I need more. I need more, you know, highlighting a paragraph. I need more. Like there's, I know you want to keep it to a certain page count, but I need more. You got to tell me more or else I'm, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, you guys know, mm-hmm. but a, a reader who doesn't know, doesn't know. Yeah, and it's it's definitely it's definitely one of the one of those things where oh I know a lot of I know culturally there's the minds there's the mindset that the best kind of works are ones with the sole creative vision you know the af, the aftermath of the um of the uh, of the of the movie brats in the seventies yeah but um what I found is that when it comes to game development to that um. Well, there's well, there's certainly instances where that can work. Um, it's not as common as one might think. Yes. Simply because of the fact that you've got so many more moving parts. You do, and and even though the game is called Jeremy M. Jack's Planet Bound because this was my um, what I gave birth to at the age of fourteen, the first line of the book is Planet Bound is so much bigger than me. Mm-hmm. That's the first line of the book. Yeah. Because it is. I mean, it has included a new, a new, innumerable amount of people uh, over the last thirty years. And it's definitely some. It's definitely something that I'll be looking forward to when it um when it comes around, so I can so I can um do my usual crack at it. Yes. <laughs> yes. And do the official review. Mm-hmm. Uh, and definitely I want on the subject of the Kickstarter, I definitely want to hit the stretch goals because these things are so, so um, not, they're just number one. One of them is historical. Mm-hmm. Uh, and number two, uh, 
they're both purposed for immersion in the, in the whole philosophy for this game is to immerse yourself successor games, the company that I created to produce this game there. That's the philosophy. That's the motto. We make games to get lot, make great games to get lost in with your friends. That's the whole point is immersive experiences. So having a soundtrack, that's the first stretch goal is a huge part of it. We wanted a soundtrack for years now because we've been listening. We always had music playing always. Uh, while we were gaming a lot mm-hmm. of gamers do it, it's there's ambiance when it comes to music but having it specific to your world is such a great thing because the mental the psychological connection of oh yeah now i know where i am because you started playing that music oh my gosh now i know what scenario is about to happen because you started playing that music that mental connection for immersion is so awesome and and terence jock is such a great composer and writer and really hit the nail on the head when it come, came to this iteration of Planet Bound for, for what I was looking for. And then even more significant and, of course, more costly is to have the game translated into American Sign Language. I'm a 22-year sign language interpreting veteran. Uh, I had hearing loss as a child. It's a native language for me. It's such a huge part of my life and a huge part of my community. I've played with deaf people for years. It is so much better. And I I know this is going to sound like I'm like, like, oh, no, if you don't know sign language, (laughs) gaming is not as good as it is in sign language. Well, I'm telling you, it is it is a better experience in sign language because I don't have to use miniatures. I don't have to over describe myself. I don't have to use a lot of words. There is no misunderstanding because it's visual and spatial. You know exactly where my hands are placing everything in every scenario so that you know exactly how to respond to it. There's very, very little misunderstanding of that. The whole game, the whole language is based on surrogacy, meaning taking on the role of whatever you are, even if it's an object, you're constantly taking on the role of the thing that you're referring to within the language itself. The Mm -hmm. language itself is role playing. So it works so beautifully when you're playing a game and playing in character um, because, because surrogacy is part of the game when it comes to um, the language itself. So having a, a, a stretch goal that includes translating the entirety of the book into American Sign Language, having it produced by deaf people, deaf, deaf nerds, <laughs> uh, deaf geeks, deaf people who love stuff like this, translating it and producing it and translating it into an American Sign Language is a massive feat and historic because it's never been done. Not even by the big gays, definitely not by TSR back in the day, and, and certainly not by Wizards of the Coast or, or Paizo or, or otherwise. Even people who have done amazing things like you talked about we, before this, we were talking about Inspirals, they, mm-hmm. they put sign language into the mechanics. That's, one, that's awesome, and it gives people you know, a hint of what they could do with sign language because you're signing certain things. That's very different than translating and producing an entire game book into another language into sign language on video and and pulling together a team of linguists to be able to do it um i was talking through talking to rpg research Mm -hmm. and they were going back and forth about how there's schisms in the in the in the uh, sign language rpg community because nobody can agree on signs well nobody can agree, agree on english words either Right. So so I don't have anything about that. We're going to establish stuff that is specific to Planet Bound uh, and whether people use it in their other games as the establishment for certain things like combat attributes, common common words that we use um, in gaming. Mm -hmm. Well, then great. Good on them. You can use them. It's not like we have exclusivity to those words or signs. And it's just a great opportunity, historic access for, for the deaf community who, who's been dying to play role-playing games, but who have been intimidated by these books that are just mass volumes of English and dense English that they're just not going to take on because English is not their native language. Yeah. And it's definitely something that I'll be, I'll be, um, I'll be, looking, for, I'll be looking forward to because I, yeah. I, um, there was, there, I do remember getting a comment from one person who, um, who I th- I think they imply that they were either deaf or mute. Um, mm. in my in my review of um Pokemon Tabletop United, mm. I think. Um. And um, that and so I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that I, that I have experience within that community, but I'm no I'm no stranger to it um sure. either. And I it's always been it's always been about expanding the hobby for me. Yeah, and 
I look f- and I look forward to seeing how Planet Bound is going to expand expand the hobby in its own way. Yep. Yep. Um, definitely. With with that in mind, I do want to thank you for braving the hell that is time zones to come to come up to the temple again. And of like course, I, like I said before, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. I love it. Um. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to come to come to the temple and enjoy, and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.